We will have a little bit of time at the end. Again, we do have a chock full um, agenda, but we will have a little bit of time for questions and answers at the end. But I encourage you to enter your questions in that chat box as we're going through the sessions today. And our speakers will keep an eye on the chat box um, when they're not speaking and they can respond. Ami and I will respond. So we will have a dialogue going in the chat box and encourage you to enter your questions in there as they come to you. So you don't need to wait till the end. So let's do a little test of that chat box. I'd love for folks on the line to introduce themselves, share your name, where you're located, and your farm or organization that you're joining us from. Welcome, Tom. All right. Looks like folks are finding the chat. As you're doing that, um, I'll just give a quick overview of kind of how we're going to roll over the next two hours. We are going to start with some very brief introductions and then get down to our speakers. We have six incredible speakers today, and they're going to be covering the gamut of policy issues from local all the way up to federal. So we'll start at the local level hearing from Andrea Clark from KC Healthy Kids, as well as Amanda Lindahl from Cultivate KC and New Rates for Refugees. Then we'll jump in to talk about state policy and how to engage at that state level with Eileen Horn, as well as Representative Yolanda Young. And then we get even bigger thinking about federal policy and engagement with Tom Bueller and Katie Nixon. So we've got incredible expertise over the next two hours, and we are so glad that you're joining us to talk. And then Ami will be kind of wrap up, uh, wrap us up and again, give you lots of ways to continue to stay engaged as we move forward. So just a quick kind of overview of why this session is happening. You, If you are just starting your agriculture or food systems work, you may be wondering how does this fit in and how do you fit in in policy? But as a grower, there are multiple levels of policy that have major impacts on where and how and what you're able to grow and to whom and how you sell your products. So this is just a few of the areas that policy has huge impacts from land price use and access to market access, conservation programs, grants and funding. And we'll hear from our speakers many more and much more um, detail and more specifics about how these types of policies are impacting their work and growers in the Kansas City area. And one thing we'll really be hitting home today and hope that you gain an understanding of as we move forward is kind of how these different levels of policy and different levels of government influence food and farming in different ways. And importantly, how you can influence those policies in different ways. So thinking about the local level, just a few examples include zoning, farmer's market locations, and other distribution opportunities. At the state level, there are agricultural promotion programs that might impact your work extension and TA, food safety, and at the federal level, of course, the Farm Bill, which we'll be hearing about from Tom, and all of the many programs that are included in that, that influence USDA funding and technical assistance. So that's just a very small glimpse into the many different policy areas that we'll be hearing from, and we are really lucky to have a great um, agenda of speakers who will be walking us through these areas, helping you understand different ways to engage and to put these tools in action. So with that, I'm gonna welcome, welcome our first speaker. We'll start by hearing from Andrea Clark. Andrea is a food system planner and policy advocate at KC Healthy Kids. She led the Greater KC Food Policy Coalition's Task Force on Planning and Zoning for Urban Agriculture in the Region. As a member of the Food Systems Division of the American Planning Association, Andrea works to advance and strengthen food systems planning and policy. Andrea, thank you so much for being here and I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Lacey. Um, I am really excited to be here today um, with uh, some of the, the folks that I work with um, on a, a regular, if not daily basis um, on these issues. So I'm glad that we could get everybody together and um, talk about policy. Um, the Greater Kansas City Food Policy Coalition, uh, which is a operates as a program within KC Healthy Kids, um, had a year-long um, task force um, 
looking into how planning and zoning impacts urban agriculture in different municipalities throughout the Kansas City region. Um, last summer, we released a report um, based on the research and engagement that we did. Um, and today I'll share some general information about planning and zoning, um, give a quick overview of the policy recommendations that the coalition is going to be advocating for, um, and um, share how you can get involved in those efforts. Um, so local planning departments um, are responsible for reviewing site plans, uh, managing development processes and developing um, long range plans and zoning policies um, that shape the built environment, including our local food systems. Um, some planning departments also um, issue permits and enforce codes or give out code violations, um, depending on how the departments are structured. Um, and this authority to adopt plans, pass zoning policies, um, and enforce them is granted to local governments um, in the state constitution. Uh, long range or comprehensive plans develop a big picture for the future um, from housing and parks to transportation and the environment. Uh, these plans can vary in scale from citywide to smaller areas or neighborhoods. And these plans are formally adopted by local governments and inform or shape um, public and private development. Um, and as some of you may know, um, food system planning is a subsect of the planning profession. Zoning um, is a tool that planners use to divide land into different categories based on permitted land uses. Um, each category or district regulates what land uses are allowed. Um, you can see uh, on this map um, a visualization of zoning. So each zoning district is assigned a standardized color um, and it gives us a bird's eye view of what uh, development in that municipality looks like. Um, so you can see um, along the river, um, this is uh, um, Wyandotte County, Kansas City, Kansas. You can see the purple um, shows an industrial corridor um, along the river. Um, you can see um, kind of like a, a red strip there um, down the middle, um, and that's a commercial corridor. Um, you can see the, the darker yellow is kind of a, a cluster of higher density housing, whereas there's more um, sprawling low density housing. Uh, the green is, is parks or open green space. And so this gives us an idea of what um, development in the city looks like based on what land uses are allowed in different areas. Um, a lot of cities have an interactive map online or a parcel viewer that gives you a view from the ground. Um, it'll tell you the number of a parcel, um, the zoning designation, um, who the landowner is and other public information. And it's a really handy tool to access um, because it will tell you what the zoning of your property is or the, the land that you're farming, um, which will help you know what land uses are allowed or are not allowed and what other rules and regulations um, apply to um, land use and, and building and structures on your property. Um, if you're interested in a vacant lot, it can also help you identify who the landowner is um, if you're interested in in using it for urban agriculture. Um, zoning ordinances are the legal document um, that outlines in detail the land use and development standards um, for different zoning districts, including building height, the types of materials, um, landscaping, et cetera. And to make a change to a zoning ordinance, um, a revision must be passed by local government. Um, so you do have to go through the same process of um, changing a law to update a zoning ordinance. Um, many cities have their codes and ordinances available online, um, which makes it easier you know, to find and navigate, um, but they're written in very professional legal jargon type language. Um, it can be really confusing to understand, um, even for people who have uh, studied urban planning or practice planning. 
Um, most zoning ordinances will also include a land use table or a list that shows what land uses are permitted in different zoning districts. And if a conditional or special use permit is required um, to do that land use, or if you can just do it as of right. Um, this is in Kansas City, Missouri. So you can see on the table, um, it shows three different types of agriculture. And um, this is for a residential district. So it shows you which type of agriculture is allowed in which districts. Um, and if there is a P there, it means it's permitted. And if there is an S, it means you need a special use permit. Um, the areas where there is a P and an S, um, it means parts of crop agriculture are permitted, but other aspects of it, like selling on site, require a special use permit. So these tables are kind of a, an easy go-to um, to get an idea of, of what land uses are allowed. Um, parcels can be rezoned um, to change the zoning district, and you can apply for variances. Um, for example, if you want to build an eight-foot fence, but you're um, restricted to six feet. However, um, these um, applications um, for variances, rezoning, or for special use permits um, go through an extensive process that takes um, several months of time. Um, and uh, there are fees. You may have to provide a site plan by a licensed architect. You have to conduct um, a kind of public hearing or a community meeting um, and present um, to like the Board of Zoning Appeals or Adjustment um, to get those changes made. And just because you apply does not mean that it will be approved. It's really done on a case by case basis, depending on the character of the neighborhood, um, support or lack of support um, by immediate neighbors um, and things like that. So some of these, the language and the processes can be um, very confusing and uh, really impact urban agriculture in um, a negative way or create barriers. Um, so that brings us to this task force report. Um, at the end, I will put a link to it in the chat. Um, this report uh, highlights um, some of the best practices for planning for urban agriculture um, for urban planners. Um, as well as uh, resources and policy recommendations um, to change zoning ordinances to make them more accommodating to urban agriculture. Um, and the Greater Kansas City Food Policy Coalition um, will be advocating over the next year, um, specifically in Kansas City, Missouri, um, to get some changes made to the zoning ordinance, um, again, to uh, be more supportive of urban agriculture. Um, but I'll share more about that at the end. Um, so in a survey that we did um, a couple of years ago as part of our research, um, almost 75% of urban farmers said that the land they cultivate is zoned residential. And because urban agriculture um, or crop agriculture is rarely permitted as a land use um, in zoning districts that are not agricultural zoning districts, um, a special or a conditional use permit will probably be required since it's not explicitly allowed. Um, so permitting urban agriculture um, where, you know, it's appropriate at a, a scale um, for the density and, and character of the community can help um, eliminate this barrier. Um, a lot of the problems is that zoning ordinances just don't address urban agriculture at all, which automatically means that you're gonna have to apply for a special use permit. Um, so explicitly permitting it in a zoning ordinance will help eliminate um, this barrier. In many zoning ordinances, um, a primary structure like a house um, or some kind of building, commercial building, um, has to be on the parcel before an accessory structure can be built, um, which can be a problem for farmers um, on vacant lots. Um, accessory structures are also limited by the number that you can have, um, the type and their design. And season extension 
presents a really unique problem um, for urban farmers and urban planners and people in the building uh, department as well um, that are interpreting um, like international building codes and standards. Um, a lot of season extension, although farmers might consider it to be temporary, um, may actually be considered permanent by the city, um, which means that you'll need a building permit. Um, because it's for farming, you might need a commercial permit. Um, so there are a, a lot of additional restrictions that might be placed on, on season extension if it's considered a permanent structure. Um, again, most zoning ordinances don't address accessory structures, especially ones that are used by urban farmers or, or community gardens. Um, and so by being really explicit in the zoning ordinance about what type of structures are allowed, um, you know, making the height restrictions um, flexible so that, you know, a high tunnel or a higher fence can be put up, um, doing things like that can help um, support urban farmers and in, in ur urban agriculture and help, um, you know, just reduce another one of the barriers that's presented by, by zoning. Um, another issue that we identified um, was related to on-site sales or um, the pickup of online sales. Um, depending on the zoning district, that might not be allowed. Um, in addition, things like mobile markets um, may not be allowed to park or operate in residential districts. That might that type of activity might be excluded to commercial districts. Um, and farmers markets tend to have more flexibility in terms of where they're located, um, but still some cities only allow them in commercial districts and don't let them um, locate in residential districts. And again, if we're talking about food access, getting food, locally grown food, healthy food, as close to the consumer as possible, especially when transportation is an issue, um, that's an important thing. Um, and again, urban planners um, can help um, alleviate this barrier by um, changing the zoning to allow on-site sales in residential districts um, and to um, let farmers markets operate in residential districts as well. Um, so you might know uh, Alicia Ellingsworth on the screen here. Um, as part of the coalition's ongoing work related to planning and zoning for urban agriculture. Um, we published the report. Um, we put together kind of like a, a video farm tour of three farms in the Kansas City region, um, Casey Farm School on Gibbs Road, Ophelia's Blue Vine Farm, and Pearl Family Farm. Um, and all of them talk about um, challenges that they've had to overcome, specifically related to planning and zoning. Um, and so this video um, will be used to uh, educate elected officials um, and to advocate for um, policy changes, again, specifically in Kansas City, Missouri right now. Um, so next year, um, we'll be working with community partners, some of whom are on uh, the call today, um, to uh, draft an updated urban agriculture ordinance um, and to advocate for it to be adopted. Um, so if you're interested in participating in those advocacy efforts, um, reach out to me. Um, my email is here on the screen. Or if you go to K Casey Healthy Kids website, um, there's a place where you can also sign up for email updates. Um, and I'll put the, the link to um, the report, the video, and um, it'll have more information about the coalition as well. But I'll put that in the chat. So um, you can also find more information as well there. Um, and I'm really great Amanda is speaking next because um, she will show what the reality of, look, of this looks like on the ground with farmers who are trying to navigate um, these, these policies. Um, so thanks for having me today um, and reach out if you would like to advocate with us. Thank you so much, Andrea. What a great kickoff and I think perfect lead into our next speaker, Amanda. And she's perfectly on time. Amanda has worked with Cultivate KC and the New Roots for Refugees program for two and a half years now. 
She, she supports farmers at Juniper Gardens Training Farm, as well as graduate farmers of the program in establishing their own urban farms in KC. So thank you, Amanda, for being here, and I'll turn it over to you. Unmute myself. Okay, there we go. Um, well, thanks so much for having me. Um, I am Amanda and I work with our New Roots for Refugees farmers. And I want, I, I'm here to share from the farmer's perspective. I am an urban grower. I do not um, sell produce. I grow for myself, um, but I've been supporting our farmers in our program for two and a half years. Um, and prior to that have supported kind of community gardens and orchards across the city. So that's um, the perspective that I'm coming from is supporting community groups and individual farm businesses um, and really getting urban food um, established and, and, and growing in, in our city. So um, yeah, I'm going to share a little bit more about how I've specifically worked with farmers in Wyandotte County. Um, that's been a primary focus of mine. Most of our, our farmers from our New Roots program are located in Wyandotte County. When they graduate from our training program, um, they are starting a farm within the county. So we do have some on the Missouri side, but I'm gonna stick today. My focus is gonna be talking about Wyandotte County as that's where I've had most of my experience. So I wanna get started and tell you all a story about um, a farmer. Um, this is Mothu and Fomchin and their, their farm family. So they graduated from our new program. Um, it will be uh, at least a year ago. So they've, they've been out of the program for a year and they purchased a farm located out in Western Wyandotte County, um, pretty close to the legends. And the, the story is about um, them trying to really get this farm established. So they've, they've still been on this, on this space for less than a year. So they've really done a lot in the year that they've been there. Um, so they are located in, a, it's a residentially zoned area. It's right across the street from a brand new Piper Elementary School. So um, it's pretty well trafficked, um, just a really great location for them and their family. And they have a uh, one a little over one acre of land and which is which is fabulous that's why they moved out there they wanted to have some space to really grow their um grow their farm so they as you can see they grow vegetables primarily um and the the story that i got to work with them is they were interested in having chickens on their farm and I, you know, am well aware that there's a six hen limit within Wyandotte County um, for a residential property, and they wanted to have more than more than six hens. Um, you know, they have like 1.3 acres, so they have they have room for that. Um, so we had to process through this uh, special use permitting. So basically, as Andrea mentioned, if you want to do anything beyond what's currently written in the code, you have to apply um, and process through that really lengthy um, process to get something approved to do anything beyond what's currently within within the that that zoning um, you know restrictions. So to have more than six chickens, they had to apply for a special use permit. So I'm gonna show you um, kind of step-by-step step what that looked like in order to legally have um, more than six chickens on their residentially zoned property. So the process, step number one is to apply for a um, pre-application meeting. And essentially that's just sending a communication to the planning department and saying, I need a pre-app meeting um, where they're just gonna ask you, what's your idea? What are you trying to do? And they're gonna give you some feedback. Um, but the pre-application meeting is a necessary meeting, but it's pretty simple. Um, and then after that, you actually fill out the application. So I processed through this um, earlier in the year and all of the application paperwork was um, something that I had to print off the website, fill it out. Um, and as Andrea mentioned, it's, it's pretty complicated. So um, 
the reason that, you know, that I am supporting these farmers is they have language barriers. Um, and so even as a, as I like to say, I'm an educated, like primary English speaking person and the, the language on the website is very complicated. Um, the applications are just really complicated. So numerous times I was on the phone with the planning department um, in order to just fill out the application because of the language on the, on the application was just so difficult. So that in, you know, once you get it filled out and then at the time we had to submit it in person. So they don't have a way to accept applications on their website, but I actually was just doing research today and see that I think you can actually submit an application online now. So they've made a few improvements, which is good. And you pay to make that application. So um, for this particular special use permit, because it's a home occupation, um, business it was an $80 permit fee but it's based on land size and kind of what what type of special use permit you're doing to have varying fees so you pay to apply um, next is to create a development plan so the basically you apply and then the planning department is going to um, give you a whole bunch of comments on your application and they're going to require that you present to them for this example, they wanted chickens, so they knew where are these chickens going to be on the property. So it wasn't too complicated um, because it wasn't, you know, a big like building um, project, but it was, I still had to, you know, kind of help them process through a, a plan of where, where the chickens were going, where their waste was going, where their house is going, all of that. Um, and, and you have to respond to, so like I said, the planning department is going to give a whole bunch of comments and feedback. Um, they even brought in the Wyandotte County um, Conservation District, which also provides comments on that um, and tells you, here are our concerns. So you have to respond with how you're going to um, meet those concerns and make the project, um, yeah, make it okay to what they see as best fit. And so that's another, you know, document that you have to have to provide. And then meet with the city inspector. So I was not a part of this because it's not on my property, but, but Mothu had to entertain several visits from a city inspector that was essentially looking at everything on his property to make sure it was up to code. So um, he had a little bit of an issue with um, the color of his garage not being, um, he made a little bit of an addition to the garage that was served as his chicken coop and the color of the siding wasn't the same as the garage. So he had to paint it all to be the same color. So a lot of those really nitty gritty like specifics that they want the roof to be the same as the other structure on the property. So those are some of the challenges. And you have to host a neighborhood meeting. So um, this included posting a yard sign that the city does provide. You have to pick it up at the city by a specific date and have it posted in your yard um, a specific number of days before you're holding your neighborhood meeting. Um, so they are very strict about dates because um, this was this is one of the steps in the process that I didn't really catch and, and was unaware of. And we were one day late to picking up the sign from the city and the planner um, Basically, I mean, she she allowed it, but she told us that we were essentially breaking the rules because we were one day late in picking up that yard sign. Um, so lots of, they're, they're very strict. Um, so hosting the neighborhood meeting is just a time that, you know, they give you a specific list of people you're supposed to invite to your meeting. It's um, folks, you know, that are within a certain area around your property, and you're supposed to get feedback from them. So um, in this situation, we were able to do a, um, basically a virtual meeting. And so I, we had to mail letters to these neighborhood, um, to the neighbors. And then I had to entertain their questions or comments, um, via phone or email. So, um, so yeah, it didn't actually require an in-person meeting, but that was, um, some COVID, like they were being nice because of COVID. So then we have to submit that, that report to the planning department. Um, and if all of that goes well, then um, we're put on the planning commission meeting and you have to attend that meeting, which 
it requires attending a meeting that can last six hours long. So um, the meeting that we went to, there was some things on the agenda that were very contested, big, big issues prior to the location that Mothu was on the agenda. So we sat in city hall for, um, yeah, I think it was like five and a half hours that night in order to be able to stand up and say, we're, you know, I'm farmer Mothu and I want to have chickens and this is how it's going to improve my farm business um, for them to say yay or nay. And then if it gets improved by the planning commission, you wait another month for it to be voted on by the entire board of commissions. So there's a long, it takes a long time. This process um, was definitely several months long as far as the pre-application meeting, the planning, I would say it was at least three months long between all those different meetings that had to happen. And then when it was finally approved at the Board of Commission's public meeting. Then when it's approved, you got to pay again because you already paid to apply, but that, you know, if you got denied, well, then you just lose that money. But if you get approved, then you have to pay again in order for it to be published and the zoning publication fee is what they call it. So basically to put it in writing and make it um, official, you pay again. So that was $125 for this particular special use permit. But of course, that range really varies based on what, what you're trying to get approved. And then in one year, we get to reapply. So the process is very long and cumbersome um, and it you have to do it multiple, you know, basically um, since this was a first approval, they would have to reapply in one year. And then my understanding is that you would get a two year approval at that, that point in time. So it wouldn't be yearly, but as long as you wanted to have this special use, you gotta keep applying um, in order to make it approved. So I, um, yeah, just want to kind of, I've, I've mentioned that's the process. Um, so some necessary improvements that I think that um, particularly Wyandotte County could, could use, but, you know, any city municipality in our area, I, I think could, could see these same improvements. So access, um, like I mentioned, my, my job is to support our farmers that have um, added barriers to accessing the system. And so number one, I think having better language access on the UG website, they do have materials in Spanish, um, but you know, Wynette County is extremely diverse. Um, I should know the number of languages that are spoken in our county. It's a lot. Um, and having access to those, um, you know, language um, services would be great. Um, the easing those applications that are super complicated that have, have language on them that are just very difficult to understand um, could show some improvements in making them more simple. Um, when I spoke with the planner, there were a few questions on there that she literally told me, well, I'm not supposed to tell you how to answer this, but I'm just going to um, rephrase the words so that it's more clear. And that's really all I needed. But like she technically wasn't supposed to even rephrase the question in words, um, which is just really frustrating. So anyways, applications could be more simple. Um, the cost that's associated with it. Um, I know in, in Wyandotte County that there are a lot of people that just don't apply because the system is very complicated and costly. Um, and so if, if those things could be improved, I think that the county would have a much better awareness of what's going on um, as people were able to comply with those rules if, if it was a simpler process. Um, I included this photo of um, farmers Bawi Mung and Zing Tae who are a, a farm couple that I've supported as well. Um, and because of the cost barriers, just like, like weren't able to apply for a lot of the things that they probably should. Um, and so it's just really, it's really interesting. Um, yeah, just to kind of, I, I know a lot of farmers that, that, that probably technically are not following the rules. Um, but I don't blame them for like not being able to access the system um, and pay these crazy fees that go with it. I mean, the amount of time that it takes because what farmer has spare time to like sit in a six hour city planning meeting um, or figure out how to, how to process through all that paperwork. So those are some of the issues. Um, and a necessary improvement um, would certainly be 
uh, urban ag zoning that to, to bridge the, the gap between agricultural zoning, which currently in Wyandotte County is only, it's supposed to be five acres or more, um, could be zoned ag and then residential zoning. And there's just a really like, there's, a, there's a, that space in between where we know a lot of urban farmers are growing a lot of great food and providing this food supply that's necessary, but um, the zoning is not set up to encourage them to put up a high tunnel or to even have a storage shed on their property. So there's just a really big um, gap for where a lot of our farmers are currently at. Um, and then I didn't speak much about the land bank, but it's another system that I think could be greatly improved in order to really facilitate the use of land bank properties on um, that space um, so that farmers could access some of that vacant land. Um, currently in Wyandotte County, it is not really a approved use of land bank properties as far as urban ag space. So they're really focused on, on um, housing development. So I would love to see improvements in the land bank use. So what can you do? So I always, I, the more and more that I learn is just to share the message. We all have friends. We all have people that we interact with, people in power positions that are um, better able to influence others. So just continuing to share, share this message um, of what, how we can really improve our, our local zoning codes um, and to support a, a greater urban ag system there. So share that message. You never know who you're going to talk to that's going to be best friends with the commission and going to be able to like really influence them. Um, and then you can get involved in local committees, um, action groups, the local food policy group, um, even just getting involved in your neighborhood. Neighborhood leaders have a lot of influence on commissioners. Um, and so get, get involved um, and know your local representatives. So there are within Wyandotte County, you know, a a list of, of county commissioners that really are the fine, have that final say on approving a special use permit. Um, and so get to know those folks and they are representatives of us. Um, I'm a Wyandotte County resident, they are representative of me. And so um, the more that we can know them and, and speak with them, I think is really, really important. And if you can advocate for that urban ag zoning, um, you know, getting involved, getting involved in the committees and work groups um, is really important um, to have more people really pushing, speaking um, towards that, that need. And then if you can run for office. So I have interacted with a lot of people um, and, uh, just sitting through some of those commission meetings, it, there's more of the older generation um, in those positions of power. And so I would just encourage anybody to think about running for office and particularly um, folks that have greater energy and might be a little younger, I think could really improve um, kind of the outlook and some of that um, mindset around the way our, our our city, what's prioritized and what's not. Um, so would definitely encourage folks if, um, if, you know, having representation of farmers and people that directly work with our urban food system to be um, in those positions of, yeah, positions of power within our local government is really important. So that's all that I have. That's great. Thank you, Amanda. And I really appreciate how you shared all those kind of different ways to get engaged based on your energy and the time that you have, but there's always something that you can do. Um, and it's really insightful to be able to understand the whole process and the detail that went in it. Um, I, we did get a message that some folks were having some trouble joining earlier. So if you're just joining us now, do wanna let you know that this is being recorded and we'll share the recording so you don't have to miss anything. Um, we had some incredible speakers focused on our local policy and now we're gonna be shifting our attention a little bit focusing more at that state level. So I'm very pleased to welcome our next speaker, Eileen Horn. Eileen currently provides consulting services to the Kansas Food Action Network and New Venture Advisors, where she works with food policy councils, local governments, and coalitions across the country to build resilient local food systems through planning and policy. Eileen also served for three years in the Kansas State Legislature as the state representative for the 10th District, which includes parts of Lawrence and Baldwin City in Douglas County. Welcome, Eileen. I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Lacey. I'm excited to be here and excited to chat with you all a little bit today. 
Um, as Lacey shared, I'm going to be talking about engaging in state level policy. So my experience uh, comes from Kansas, but the next speaker will be talking about Missouri. So um, some of the things are same across the state line, some are a little bit different, but um, we'll, we'll try to point those out. Um, so first, just a little bit of basics about the Kansas legislature. So the Kansas legislature can consists of 125 member House of Representatives. Each House member has a district of about 25,000 people or so. So those of you who live in the metro probably see a lot of signs for House reps because it's so densely populated. Um, but in some areas, you know, in far western Kansas, there are multiple counties um, that are pulled together in a district. And then there's a 40 member Senate. So uh, House members have two-year terms and senators have four-year terms. So every single member of the House of Representatives is up for re-election this fall here in three weeks. So, um, so there are definitely opportunities to, to change or um, continue to keep some good leaders in there. Um, the session runs January through May each year. And I always thought it was cool that this was basically set up so that farmers could come and serve in Topeka in the legislature during uh, during the quiet time on the farm and get back in time for wheat harvest. Um, it's still that same schedule. It happens every year, um, the, that five month session. And uh, there's still a lot of ag producers, a lot of farmers, a lot of ranchers and landowners who are um, serving in the legislature. So even though agriculture makes up a kind of an ever diminishing um, portion of our employment in the state, it's still a strong, as you know, economic driver and there's still um, you know, strong support for and representation by farmers and, and ranchers of the state house. So I put a link to the uh, the legislature's website. I'll go ahead and just drop it in the chat for you all. But um, the I think what's good to know about this website is you can find anything you need here. So you can find how to contact your rep. You can live stream any committee hearings. Um, you can find agendas for all the meetings that you might be interested. So that's the official website of, of the Kansas legislature. Um, so if you don't know who your rep is, don't worry. There's this handy little tool. I'm going to drop it in the chat. And those of you who are from Kansas, go ahead and go to kslegelookup.org. And um, go ahead and put that in your browser and navigate to it. And what it allows you to do, which is super fun tool, is you can look up your Kansas legislature legislator and you put your um, address in the bar and it tells you this. Um, if you're not from Kansas, you can just make up a Kansas address, <laughs> or maybe you know someone's address on the Kansas side of the line that you can put in here. Um, but let's let's pause this for a second. Go ahead and do this, um, and um, and then maybe you can drop in the chat the results that you found. Um, I'll do my old address um, when I lived in Kansas. So I lived on Vermont Street in Lawrence, and what it tells me is that. My Kansas House District is District 10. The blue bar means that that's represented by a Democrat. And I'm in Kansas Senate District 2, also represented by a Democrat. It tells you their names, their email addresses, their phone numbers, their address in the Capitol, their home address. Um, so everything else that you would need um, to connect with them. And then if there's any notes to know about them. So Christina Haswood was new in 2021. She was going to occupied the seat after I uh, vacated it. And then um, Marcy Francisco is the Senate Ag, or the Senate Agenda Chair, sorry, I wish Ag. <laughs> um, but she's the Senate Agenda Chair. Um, so yeah, go ahead and throw those in the chat once you have yours um, and share with everybody who your, who your reps are. That's great. Oh, and Ami, thanks for putting the Missouri House and Senate. Okay, so this is pretty similar on the Kansas and Missouri side, but Yolanda can correct me if, um, if there are major differences. But my understanding follows a similar path. Um, not surprisingly, it's not at all like Schoolhouse Rock um, would have led, led us to believe. <laughs> um, but when a bill moves through the process, it can get pretty complicated. So I'm gonna show you like how, when a bill is introduced in the legislature, it moves through the process. But I really just want to focus on what you can do about it. So you don't have to worry about like knowing all the mechanics of how a bill moves through the process, but um, I'll make sure to highlight where are really good intervention points. Um, so this beautiful graphic is courtesy of the Kansas Legislative website. <laughs> um, 
But how a bill works is basically so there's a piece of legislation that's drafted. It's usually introduced by a member of the legislature. So if you want to have something introduced, you either have it introduced with a legislator or through a lobbyist. But I bet most of you all don't have your own private lobbyists. So if you wanted to have a bill introduced, you'd have to work with a senator or a representative to, um, to introduce it. The way, the way it works is you introduce a bill and then it gets referred to the committee that it's supposed to be working on. So if it's a bill about farming or urban agriculture, it uh, would likely be referred to the agriculture committee. Um, then in that committee, if the committee chair wants to, they'll bring it up for discussion in committee. This is a real bottleneck in the Kansas legislature is if that chair doesn't like it, they don't have to bring it up. There's nothing, there are a lot of procedures you can do to like force a bill to be heard in committee. Um, so that's that's one challenge um, in, in state houses is there's a lot of control by those committee chairs. Um, but then if you have a hearing, so if you can get some committee chairs to have a hearing on that bill, then what that means is basically the legislators sit in a circle, it's a small group of them between nine and 13, depending on the committee, and they talk about it. And it's mixed, it's Democrats and Republicans, and um, and they talk about the bill, they can make changes to it, which are called amendments, um, and then they send it on to the House of Origin. What that means is if it's a House bill, it gets sent to the full House of Representatives, so for the 125 people to vote on, if it's a Senate bill, it goes to the Senate floor and for the 40 senators to vote on. So that's called the Committee of the Whole, that's step four, and there's deliberation and approval there, and it can include amendments, which are changes to the bill, and then the whole House or the whole Senate votes and just determines if that bill is going to pass that House of Origin. Um, so let's say it passes. So you have this bill that has been introduced in committee, it's made it through committee, it's gotten onto the floor, it's been debated, and it's passed. Then it can take a couple different paths. So it can go, let's say it was a House bill, it then would go over to the Senate. The Senate can do this, pass it in the same form as the House of Origin, that first step on the left. That'd be the easiest path that hardly ever happens that way. Everybody wants to like tinker with it and change it. Um, if if there are changes made by the Senate, so there's amendments made, then it gets sent back to the House, and the House can say, "We like your changes. We're fine with them. It's fine." Or if the Senate makes changes, it goes back to the House, and the House says, "We don't like your changes." Then it goes to a conference committee and a small group of senators and representatives hammer the changes. These are usually like six people in a room, three reps, three senators, and um, they there's not a lot of transparency in my opinion about this part of the process, but it's frankly where a lot of the big changes happen. And those conference committees usually happen in May at the end of the session. So there's there's a flurry of activity at the end because a lot of these smaller details are getting hammered out in those conference committees. So however it goes through the Senate, if it passes, then it would go to the governor. The governor can sign the bill into law, or if he or she waits 10 days and doesn't touch it, it becomes law without their signature. So sometimes for political reasons, they decide not to touch it, and it just becomes law without their signature. Um, or the governor can veto the bill. So if the governor doesn't agree with the policy, the governor can veto the bill. And it goes back to the legislature and the legislature can decide to try to override him or her with a two thirds vote in the house and the Senate. And if they do that, then it becomes law. Um, usually ag bills aren't this controversial. <laughs> these are the, these are like, um, these kind of override moves um, are for a lot of the hot button issues that you all have heard um, the legislature debate over the past couple of years. So that's the process for, but really, um, it's pretty wonky. And I think for you all, it's most important to think about kind of how you intervene and how you can weigh in. Um, so in the House and the Senate, there are committees that I would suggest you all look up, see if your rep serves on that committee. Um, but these are the ones most likely to touch um, food and farming activities. Uh, the ones in green I highlighted are probably the most likely, but also sometimes, um, you know, Children's and Seniors Committee heard about Farm to School last year. Um, the Taxation Committee talked about the you know, reducing the state sales tax on food. So sometimes there are food system related bills and other committees, but those in green are really the primary ones. And 
um, where I would focus my efforts is understanding what those committees are debating and how you can talk to um, the members on the committee. So I included this um, to help you think about how to make your voice heard because it, it can be hard to figure out how to weigh in and how to do it effectively. Um, so this arrow is basically an increasing level of effectiveness, right? So a blast campaign email, it's fine. If you jump on the bandwagon with those, those are good. I liked getting them sometimes because it helped me justify numbers. I could say 100 people from my district care about this. It must be important because I got this blast email. But frankly, since I know they're easy to do, I didn't put a lot of weight on it because it, you're just like copying and pasting somebody else's thoughts. Um, so those are good in that they show a lot of volume and energy, but I wouldn't say that they were ever like super convincing um, to me to help me change my mind. Personal emails, on the other hand, were really, I liked a lot because you could get information, you could read it on your phone while you're on the house floor debating that bill. <laughs> and I liked having that information. Um, phone calls to senators or reps offices are also effective because we get these like bright pink notes on our desk saying who called from our district and what they called about. And knowing that people took time out of their day to make a phone call always mattered to me and I always tried to return those in a timely manner. Um, often your state rep or state senator will have like a legislative coffee when they're in district. So they'll host events, um, get on their website, find out when those events are and go talk to them. Sometimes they only have like five to 10 people show up at a legislative coffee. So they had a ton of time and attention and could really tell me their story and like what they were concerned about. Um, so that's a really good way to get some face time. Another good way that shows a lot of um, initiative on your part is to request a meeting with them and meet with them in Topeka. They, um, we have breaks in our day specifically to meet with constituents, usually on the house side, like in between 10 and 11 in the morning and then the afternoon between committees. So we have time blocked on our calendars to meet with constituents in, um, in Topeka. And if you're nearby and able to do that, that's a really great way to get some face time with your legislator. And then I think one thing that would be really great is when they are home in district, so when they're outside of the session or they, they get breaks in that January to May timeframe when they're home, invite them to your farm, invite other farmers to come and talk about what you're concerned about. Like those kind of events when I got to go to someone's business or farm or organization, really stuck with me because I got to meet the people, I got to see their facility and those stories um, really resonated. Um, so just in general tips though, like we're people too and nobody likes to be yelled at. So please, you know, when you make these outreach efforts, be nice, um, be a nice human to, to them. Um, also tell a story, like we get a million fact sheets. The last thing we need are like 10 more bullet points. There's, and we have a whole um, Kansas Legislative Research Department that can pull any, any data point we want. So like, it's not lack of information that drives bad decisions in Topeka. That's a whole other story. It's not lack of information, um, but, but stories really matter. People tell a lot of stories. People like trade in stories, right? Like this person in my district is struggling with this. So tell a story that sticks with your legislator and then give them your cell number if you're, um, if you're comfortable with that because there were so many times that I was in a committee hearing or on the house floor and I had a very specific question and I could just in the moment text that constituent and say, okay, we're debating this bill. We're thinking about this amendment. Would that work for you? And if people got back to me right away, it was so great because then I could advocate for them like in the moment and in, in the debate. Um, so if you're willing to be kind of there like, phone a friend lifeline, um, that's great. And it was so helpful to me to be able to like, cause things happen fast in the state house. And so you need to like be able to reach out and, and get an answer quickly. Um, so those are just some general tips. I would also say um, these organizations, and I know Lacey is compiling this list to send to you all, but these are some other ones that I think do a really great job of keeping folks informed about what's happening in the state house. So the ones on the left are like the farm organizations. Uh, the ones on the right also deal in, in food systems issues. Um, and um, as you know, some of these organizations have different political events. Sign up for all the newsletters, you know, like get all the information that you can. Um, and and then you can you know get all the information and decide for yourself where you land on a particular issue. 
And um, I guess my final plug, because I know I'm running out of time, is elections are coming up. And as I said, all 125 members of the House, um, some key races, including the governor, um, are coming up here on the 8th. So um, ksvotes.org is where you can register. You can check and make sure you're registered. You can change your address, whatever you need to do. Um, you can also apply to vote by mail. So if you're going to be um, unable to make it to the polls on election day, uh, you can do that, or you can track your advanced ballot. So if you already mailed it in, it'll tell you like where it is in the process. Um, so just a couple of deadlines. You need to register to vote by the 18th of October. If you want to request an absentee ballot, you'd have to request that by the 1st of November. Um, advanced voting exists and it's enabled in all Kansas counties, um, but it varies. So check with your county, uh, county clerk's office. Um, they're usually the ones that oversee um, elections. And election day is on November 8th. I know that was a lot of information, but I'm happy to entertain questions. And I was not monitoring the chat well, so <laughs> what else do I need to answer? Thank you so much, Eileen. That's great. If folks want to add their um, questions in the chat as we keep going, I'm sure Eileen will take a look and can respond. And that's such great insight to know what are our legislators listening to and how do you become that, that phone a friend? Um, so we are going to cross state lines and we've actually heard in the chat box and seen some photos um, from our next speaker already, but we are very happy to in welcome Representative Yolanda Young. Representative Young is a longtime Kansas City resident who grew her vegetable growing from, from containers up to a small business, Young Family Farm. Young Family Farm currently has um, about an acre in production and participates in the Ivanhoe Farmers Market, CSAs, and sells from their farm site at 38th and Wayne Avenue. And in addition to this farm work, she is also um, attending to her duties as a state representative in the House of Representatives for District 22 where she serves on the Agricultural Policy Committee, which we, as we heard, is an important one to stay connected to, Workforce Development and Criminal Justice Committees. So welcome, Representative Young. I will turn it over to you. You're muted. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you so much, um, Lazy Ami, for inviting Young Family Farm to be a part of this um, wonderful discussion today. I was listening to you um, sort of refer to my, my history, and I hope that the listeners, after hearing it, that I started my gardening, my growing in containers on my back porch can feel at ease and not feel intimidated when we talk about growing your own food. Uh, I come from a, um, a large family in the South. I always have to talk about my Southern family because those are my roots. Um, I learned my growing skills from fam my family on both sides, on my mom's, on my dad's side of the family. Everybody either had a farm or a ranch or a garden of some sort. And so when I moved to uh, the urban core here in Kansas City, one of the things I missed so much was um, walking out and pulling up fresh food. Um, so my container gardening turned into, um, over time, a business, which I had never planned to have or own an urban farm business. And as a producer, um, and, and what I've heard already being discussed, some of the barriers are simply getting access to the space, getting access to land, uh, which is one of the reasons why I initially grew in containers. But getting access to the land, uh, the zoning, I know there was a lot of wonderful work done um, in Kansas City about a, a decade ago with Cultivate and many others. Um, who worked on some of those zoning issues with the city. Um, but the other part is, if you get the land, now it's time to grow. So that takes money, that takes capital, um, which a lot of farmers, if you're speaking of the typical or average uh, Missourian or a neighbor, they may not necessarily have the capital to start this whole process of growing and particularly for growing for selling. 
So we ran into um, those barriers that a lot of farmers uh, run into now, a lot of, a lot of urban farmers. Um, in terms of how policy impacts what we do uh, is really key to being able to move uh, and move forward in terms of getting food out to um, Missourians. I won't bore you with a lot of the processes. I think um, Eileen over in the Kansas, the, to explain the Kansas legislator, it's really simple. Um, it's really um, fairly similar, I'll say, to what we do in Missouri. We have 163 members uh, in the House. Uh, where I serve, we have 34 uh, in the Senate. We serve, each serve in the House about an average of 35, 36,000 um, residents here in Missouri. Uh, the committee structure and the committee process about, is about the same. Uh, you introduce a bill, the, you um, introduce a bill, it goes to committee. If it's second read, it goes to committee. You get a hearing and the public is able to come in and um, testify in favor of or against or just uh, for information sake on that bill. So those are similar similarities with what uh, Kansas does, but I wanna talk a little bit about a specific piece of legislation that I have been hearing around town that was confusing to so many people. Um, a bill that was just recently passed in the house as it relates to urban farms and other, other agricultural uh, provisions. Um, the bill 1720, originally, the bill originally um, was uh, sponsored by Representative Pollock. Now Democrats, I'm a Democrat and I don't wanna get real political here, but I have to talk about this bill and the timeline of events on how, of how this bill sort of went through the process here. Um, Representative Young, I'm sorry yeah. to interrupt. I'm wondering if you might shift your camera a little bit so we could see your yeah. face a little bit better. I, I'll tell you my camera clip is broken. Okay. So I'm, I'm having to, sorry about that. I'm having no to problem at all on something that's not really balancing well. How is that? That's better. If it's able to go up a little bit, if not, will enjoy hearing you. Okay. I am so sorry, it's broken. I need to get a new one. But uh, on, I sit on the Agricultural Policy Committee and in general, the Democrats, there are five of us, it's a 17 member committee and there are five Democrats on this committee and in general, um, everyone supported the contents of the agricultural tax credit bill. So it evolved around a tax credit. Um, during the reg regular session, it was actually supported unanimously. Uh, and one, because we support Missouri farmers, um, including urban farmers. And that's been a sort of a large fight in the committee because most of the focus has been around just rural farming. And oftentimes urban farming gets omitted or overlooked or is not um, given the, the sort of uh, space and the need uh, to, to bring up. So, but we, we passed the bill out of the house with um, Democrat and Republican support. W one thing um, I heard Eileen say when she was talking about the process of a bill. It can pass or the governor can veto it. And what happened in this case, Governor Parson uh, vetoed the bill. Um, and that's basically just refused the bill to become a law. And this was in our regular session. The original bill contained a provision on most of the tax credits called the sunset clause. So the sunset clause basically is a period of time and where where the the, the bill is um, active and then it expires. So there was a two-year sunset clause. Um, 
the governor then called a special session once our regular session, which runs January to May, just like Kansas ended, the governor called a special session to pass the same law as the bill HB 1720, except there was one difference. There was a six year sunset clause that was added to it. Well, it raised some red flags for a number of people. Um, and one of the red flags amongst both Republicans and Democrats was they surmised that since the governor himself was a farmer, it meant that he could theoretically benefit from legislation that he had planned to sign. Now, this is just, I'm, I'm telling you how it happened. So um, there are things that happened in the House uh, and in the Senate that a lot of people are not aware of. So while he can't um, take advantage of it while he's in office, he can certainly take advantage of it once he's out of office. So it went from a two-year sunset to a six-year sunset, and it just raised a lot of flags for a lot of people, including the fact that the bill also provides, provides uh, foreign, um, other foreign companies to take advantage of these tax credits. So that was a red flag and a big concern for a lot of people because they felt that it would take away the local, um, the local support for farmers locally. And so I don't know how many of you were watching what was happening in the, in the uh, chambers when this bill was being pushed through, but a lot of people voted no, who had previously voted yes. Uh, some people voted present. Uh, I was one who voted present uh, because it did raise some concerns, but I am very supportive of farmers. I'm a farmer myself. I'm an urban farmer. Um, some of those issues that arose, especially with the uh, foreign-owned corporate farms, uh, applying for the credits was a red flag for me and for some of my constituents. So, <clears throat> This was, you know, sort of the conflict that was going on with HB 1720 that so many people were uh, up in airs about. Um, I do believe as an elected official, we have a responsibility to spend our money wisely and not send our taxpayer dollars to our personal business. Um, a lot of the people, again, felt that this was something that um, was done as a, uh, a sort of a sort of a ploy. This is an election year, as I said, this is an election and all the seats in the House are up for election and people are um, doing things um, to, you know, I, we believe or a lot of people believe to advance their political careers. But this is where this bill lies. It actually ended up passing it by just one vote, I believe. It passed by a vote. Um, and so there was an opportunity to work on it a bit, but um, that was not the case. That didn't happen. We could have actually worked on it and sent it to the Senate and they sent it back and all of that process, uh, but it didn't happen. We did have members in our caucus that offered uh, several amendments to make it better, but that also was not um, allowed because we did not really get the opportunity to debate on the floor as we should have. So anyway, um, that sort of, um, that's what happens a lot with these bills. They start out as one thing, they end up as another. And a lot of times your representative will change their votes based on new information or new provisions that are put in the bills. Um, I would say one of the biggest ways that urban farmers or constituents, uh, Missouri or residents can impact policy, and I'm probably being redundant, but get to know your representative. The first step is really finding out who represents you, um, who is bringing your voice to the legislature. And start locally. Don't wait until they're a state rep or a, a, a federal representative. Start locally, because a lot of the people um, 
will continue to move up and work their way up through their polit they make a political career out of it and if you start building those relationships early i believe you have a greater chance of having their ear and being and you know and having the ability to get some legislation through that's important to you and important to your community so you know again one of the biggest things i'll say is please get to know your representative there's a takeaway uh, on my end today is get to know your rep, call them. They're there for that. Uh, they're there to serve. And you can do that via uh, telephone, email. You can even um, make visits to the Capitol, which I know is timely and costly for a lot of uh, Missourians. But I do believe it has an impact. I know it's impacted me when I see people drive the distance to come down to talk to me about a piece of legislation that's really important to them, um, a phone call, and even um, coming to a committee meeting where you can voice or you can testify in favor of or against a particular piece of legislation. So, you know, um, I initially was going to talk a little bit more about uh, the whole legislative process. I think Eileen did a, a, a wonderful job with that. It's very similar. Uh, what we do in Missouri to what they do in Kansas, but I'd heard so much about um, the confusion around this recent urban tax credit bill, and I wanted to make sure that I share that with you so that you know the audience would know uh, where that stood, and it actually passed. So, and I think that's it because. Um, Everything else I think has been mentioned uh, in terms of uh, at the state level. Thank you so much, yeah. Representative Young. You are welcome. It's so helpful to see how that kind of process moves in action with that example that I know that a lot of people are aware of and have been hearing about. So it's really um, so helpful to kind of understand that process. And we are grateful you're here and thanks for the advice. We are gonna Thank take a, another step getting bigger and move into our federal policy discussion. So we're gonna start by hearing from Tom Bueller. Tom is the exec executive director of the Kansas Rural Center. He also owns and operates a small scale vegetable farm and has been growing vegetables organically in the Kansas River Valley since 2006. Tom was the founding member of the Kansas City Food Hub, a farmer owned cooperative and currently serves as the organization's treasurer. Tom, I'll turn it over to you. Great, thank you. Um, can you all see my screen? All right. Um, yeah, unlike our previous two speakers, um, I am not a uh, like in-depth lived uh, experience expert on what I'm going to talk about. Um, so I am relatively new to federal farm policy, but I'll share with you what all I know about uh, how to make some change on federal farm policy through grassroots advocacy. Um, here's a quick outline of what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the Farm Bill. Um, in another year, we might spend a little bit less time talking about that. Um, but the current Farm Bill is up for reauthorization or a new Farm Bill is up for authorization within the scope of a year. Um, so that's going to really um, have a lot of impact on what things look like in American agriculture uh, for, you know, the next five or six years. So we'll go through uh, a lot on the farm bill, um, and then I'll give you some steps um, at maybe the federal policy level, how to stay in the loop, and then how to take action um, when things that are uh, important to you come up. Um, so I'll just do a little bit of sort of farm bill 101 here. Um, the current Farm Bill uh, is officially the Agriculture Improvement Act of 2018. Um, so if you're looking for it in actual law, um, that's what it's called. It's not called the Farm Bill, but everybody calls it the Farm Bill otherwise. Um, it's a very big bill. So the current bill is like, you know, 580 pages or something like that. Um, and some version of it is passed every five to six years. 
So the current bill expires um, on September 30th, 2023. Um, so there's going to be a rush between now and then uh, to pass something else. And we know um, like there's currently a continuing resolution on the budget. And I'll talk about what that means in just a second or actually in a couple minutes. Um, so it might not get passed by September 30th, 2023. Um, and there might be um, a little bit of, you know, let's take another month or two to figure that out. Um, but there's really kind of a deadline um, to figure that out. So there might be a little bit of uh, additional time added to that, but really sometime next year, we're expecting a new version of the farm bill to come into existence. Um, and I'll show you uh, a little bit of the scope of the farm bill, but the reason it's really important um, is because it defines a lot of the programs that really um, shape the food and agriculture world, both the ones that affect, um, you know, urban growers, small scale growers, um, but also the ones that affect like agriculture um, across the country. So uh, if you want to know, uh, you drive around, and you're like, why are people growing so many corn and soybeans all over the country? Like, I don't eat that much field corn or very many soybeans every year. Why are they growing that much? Um, a lot of that's due to subsidies that are in the farm bill. So um, the scope of the farm bill really shapes um, the American landscape um, and agriculture across the country. So it's a really important uh, piece of federal legislation. The farm bill has 12 different titles. Um, so these are all different sections. Um, they haven't all always been there. They have get added over time. Um, so there's the opportunity. This is the current, uh, I guess, the current farm bill. Um, these are the titles that are there. They could uh, mix things up um, in the future. And some of them, um, you know, are pretty straightforward. Commodities is about providing subsidies to uh, some of those commodity crops, corn, soybeans, sorghum, cotton, rice, um, conservations about conservation practices on the farm. Uh, nutrition is one that's, you know, really about providing food to people, nutritious food. And that's uh, one of the big points that I'll sort of highlight uh, very clearly on the next slide. Uh, but we call this the Farm Bill, uh, but a lot of it's really about food. It should be called the Food and Farm Bill um, because a lot of the spending that comes out of the Farm Bill is really in this nutrition title, not in all of the farm provisions. Um, but it's got all sorts of other things, rural development, research extension, um, horticulture, and these don't always line up, uh, I guess, with the programs that are under them. So for instance, if anybody's ever heard of the Farmer's Market Promotion Program, um, that's under the horticulture title. And why that is, I don't know. I mean, you can sell meat at a farmer's market. You could get a Farmer's Market Promotion Program grant to promote that, um, but it's part of the horticulture title. So they don't always make sense, but this kind of gives you a rough um layout of what the farm bill looks like in terms of content. Now, in terms of spending, it's a very different picture. Um, so there's really what uh, they call sort of the big four here. Uh, and I took this uh, graphic um, from the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition. I'll show you a link uh, to them later because they're a great resource if you want to learn about federal uh, farm policy um, and uh, take action on the farm bill. Uh, but this is for the current farm bill based on the, the spending allocations in that the 2018 Agricultural Improvement Act. Um, how much money were people looking to spend? And you see that that big blue three quarters of the circle is the nutrition title. So that is uh, predominantly SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Um, sometimes people say, oh, it used to be called food stamps. Yeah, that's it. Um, so a huge percentage of spending on the farm bill um, is on food. So it should really be called the Food and Farm Bill. Um, and the reason these two things are kind of combined is because agriculture is a pretty small part of the American economy at this point, or the, the, the number of people involved in it. Um, and so to get a big subsidy package passed for that, they have to tie it to something that uh, a larger percentage of the population might support, um, like a, a safety net uh, for people to access food and kind of vice versa. So um, this becomes sort of, you know, I guess, I don't know what a, a red and blue coalition almost by, by mixing these different uh, um, pieces. Uh, but as you can see, uh, even of those 12 titles, even if we get rid of the nutrition title, there's really in the in the farm side, 
um, commodity programs, uh, crop insurance, and conservation um, are almost all of the farm side of that. And there's that little purple sliver that's everything else. So that's the horticulture, the forestry, um, all those other programs, all those other titles are a tiny sliver of the total farm bill. Um, this is pretty similar to kind of the pathway that uh, Eileen laid out uh, for bills in the Kansas House. Um, so between now and next September, as they're looking to pass a new farm bill, um, there's a Senate Agriculture Committee and a House Agriculture Committee, and they're going to talk about different parts. Um, they're going to put something on the floor of the full um, bodies. Um, those will pass something at some point. Uh, and then um, there will be a conference committee. So whatever's different, they'll iron out those differences. Um, then that bill has to go back and pass. And once it's passed both chambers, then the president has to sign the bill for it to become law. Um, so at almost any of these points, there's really opportunities to have some influence um, and what's really important, I think the key point is to have influence on those early stages. So um, the, the big changes, the big things that make it into that farm bill uh, happen at the House and Senate Agriculture Committees. Um, so here's sort of the current representation uh, for Kansas and Missouri. So Kansas, right now we have Sharice Davids and Tracy Mann on the House Agriculture Committee. In Missouri, uh, Vicki Hartzler is on there, but um, she is not up for re-election, so we'll see um, what committees get assigned in the next uh, period or who's on there, maybe someone from Missouri, maybe not. Um, on the Senate Ag Committee, uh, currently we have Roger Marshall. And then on the Senate Ag um, in Kansas, uh, their Ag Appropriations, excuse me, in Kansas, there's Jerry Moran um, and in Missouri, Roy Blunt, again, not uh, running for re-election. So we don't know exactly how the people that succeed them um, we'll get appointed onto committees. That happens at the beginning of each new Congress, um, but that's the current step. And I will talk a little bit just real quickly here about appropriations. So um, in addition to the Farm Bill saying there will be these programs that serve uh, these different areas, um, they can set uh, financial limits on those programs, and some of that's mandatory, so they can say you have to spend this much money on this program, um, like SNAP, they do that. And then some other programs, uh, like the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program, SARE, um, that has, you can spend up to this amount of money. So right now, uh, the current farm bill says you can spend up to $60 million on the SARE program. And so every year that has to go through this appropriations process where that other committee, the Senate and the House appropriations, uh, decide how much money is, is to be awarded. Um, so obviously you want to have um, that sort of mandatory funding is better, um, but then having influence on those people on the appropriations committee is important for those programs that are maybe um, not guaranteed funding. Um, but to argue how much funding they can get each year. So talking about the 2023 Farm Bill, what's on the table? Uh, literally absolutely everything. Um, so there were 150 organizations, including the Kansas Rural Center, uh, that signed a letter to the president uh, calling for a transformative farm bill, like let's change the food and farm system to make something that is climate smart, um, you know, equitable for all people, um, besides just the climate, otherwise environmentally friendly, uh, uh, safe for workers, a long number of lists. Um, but that's probably not going to change. I mean, there's probably not going to be a totally transformative farm bill uh, unless we have a lot of different political pressure than we do right now. So more realistically, we're talking about making some sort of small and incremental changes. Um, so maybe getting something like permanent funding for SARE rather than making it go through the appropriations process each year. Um, some programs right now that were rolled out during COVID, like the Local Food Procurement Act, um, where um, local uh, food pantries uh, can buy locally produced food. Um, those were sort of temporary programs. The next farm bill could make those permanent. Um, we can change some of the details of existing programs. So if you've ever applied for a farmer's market promotion program grant or a local foods promotion program grant, right now they require a 25% match. Um, the farm bill, the next farm bill could say that only has to be a 10% match, sort of lowering the burden for small organizations to apply for those grants. 
Um, and other things we could do is like we could ask for caps on crop insurance subsidies for large farms. Um, that's something that NSAC, the National Sustainable Ag Coalition, has done a lot of work on. Would influence very few people, but it would save a ton of money. Um, so there's a few really large farms that make a lot of money off those. Um, anyhow, so there's a lot of things that can can happen um, for the good. Um, just to to be brief here and uh, make sure we have some time to hear Katie. Um, I'll, I'll give you some options here. I'm going to try and dump this in the chat as I talk, but. Uh, really, I think the first step of engaging on this is kind of staying in the loop. Um, so there's a lot of organizations um, that I, I follow um, that some of them have weekly, like uh, NSAC has a weekly policy update where they talk about, is there something that's happening this week? If not, maybe there's nothing to do. Um, National Young Farmers Coalition has some great policy priorities for the next farm bill. If you can follow what they're saying, get on these email lists, um, they will send out updates. Like if it's time to call your representative, they'll let you know. Um, so that's uh, kind of the first step to do. Um, so beyond signing up for email lists to stay in the loop on that, um, maybe engage with some farmers organizations. So the Farmers Union and the Farm Bureau both come up with policy platforms every year. Um, the Farmers Union does that in a very like member centric way where you can go through and, and debate each sort of word um, on their platform, at least in Kansas they do. Um, but those organizations have a lot of uh, pull nationally. So engaging on those policy debates at the grassroots level um, can help change federal policy. Watch those committee assignments. So again, just like in the House uh, and Senate locally at the state level, um, those are gonna come out for the next session of Congress after the election. Um, and the people that are on those agriculture and ag appropriations committees will have a lot of power. So if your representative is one of those people, um, pay attention and be ready to write them some letters, give them a call, get to know them. Um, staying on those email lists can really help you with the timely engagement. Um, so right now, um, there's really not a lot to do uh, on the farm bill. So you could write a letter to your representative, um, but they're probably going to ignore it because they're worried about the election next month. Um, but there will be a time when there is a bill that's up for vote. And if their constituents are saying you need to vote yes or no, that can sometimes matter. Um, even if they're very politically different than you, maybe sometimes they just won't vote on that issue or, or they, they won't, uh, you know, push the sort of opposing agenda. So uh, even in that sense, um, it can be helpful to reach out. Um, and a lot of organizations will fly in farmers to go to D.C. Um, and talk with them. I've done this once for the Kansas Farmers Union. It's a great opportunity to learn about uh, how things work in D.C., which is a little scary if you go there. Um, your country is run by a bunch of 20-year-old, uh, 25-year-old staffers, basically. Um, but you can go there and, and tell people your stories, and that can influence how those people vote um, in the future. Um, again, uh, just to close out, there's my email address. If you have any questions, feel free to email me. Um, and I run over. I'm sorry, Katie, but uh, I'll pass it along. Thanks, Tom. It's a lot of great information. We'll be sure to share all of those links, links with everybody in the follow-up email, as well as Tom's contact information. And we are going to move right along to Katie, who's going to help bring these pieces together. So Katie and her husband run Greengate Family Farm, which is a certified organic farm, retail, and wholesale farm in Wheatland. Katie works off the farm three days a week for a nonprofit as their food systems director in West Central Missouri. She's also a co-founder and president of the board of the KC Food Hub. In these roles, she's been successful in securing over $2 million in grant funds to support this work. Katie, the floor is yours. Thanks. Well, <laughs> being at the end of this train is a long haul, right? <laughs> There's a lot of information. Tom, thanks for that recap of the farm bill. That was great. Um, put it really uh, easy to understand and easy to understand terms. And it's it's a monster. Um, I actually heard Wes Jackson once from the Land Institute. They do research on perennial agriculture. And, uh, you know, he was advocating for the 50-year farm bill, which if we're looking at sustainability, you know, that's what we should be thinking about. So, um, thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to more talk about, like, engaging in policy from more of an informal perspective and, and being a producer and how you can kind of engage um, and change minds, I think is really where I've been at my whole career. Um, I When I was young, 
I would see those people in power and um, those decision makers and um, kind of think, oh, they really know what they're doing. They have it together. They're really like infallible to some degree. I mean, I didn't put them on a pedestal, but when I, when I got into actually working with some of the folks, I realized, oh, they're just normal humans. Like, just like our parents, when we were young, we thought they knew all the answers. And then you got to their age and you're like, oh, they didn't know anything. <laughs> so I think that's good to keep in mind is like, we are all just learning together. And I, um, and I liked what Eileen said, um, be a nice human. Um, and we can, when we're civil, we can get things done. But there's also, you know, you also need to be a troublemaker sometimes too. Um, and I, I like to play that role sometimes. <laughs> I've had my share of uh, protests outside of different places. But anyways, that was, a, that was another time. Um, so I wanted to talk about, you know, our farm, we um, are certified organic and there's been a lot of talk about the organic label and the integrity of the organic label. Um, and so, as an example of how we engage in policy as farmers is that we become certified organic. Um, and because we're part of that system, we have more legitimacy when we actually try to help keep the integrity strong within the organic label. Um, and so that's like one sort of informal way that we, well, it's formal. I mean, we pay money to get certified and we use that seal, um, but we definitely um, pay attention to what's happening on the National Organic Standards Board, which is meeting next week. Um, and you should be very proud that we have a Missouri farmer on the National Organic Standards Board, um, Liz Grasnick from Happy Hollow Farm. She's a certified organic farmer um, and she was a appointed to the board um, just this year. So I'm really excited that she's on the board to sort of look after the rules because the rules can be changed by um, people who have money to send lobbyists to really change people's minds. Um, so that's one way that uh, we, we engage in policy on our farm is we actually participate. And I'll talk about the other ways we participate. Um, another way to engage is to become a reviewer on these grant committees. Um, the grants are, are uh, products of these policy um, enactments. So Farm Bill has a lot of grant opportunities and where you can get access to taxpayer dollars. Um, and a lot of times the grant reviewers, you know, they're making decisions on who is getting funded and they are people like you and I. Um, and so when we have diverse representation on the, on the grant review panels, we get more diverse grants funded because those diverse participants understand nuanced proposals that another participant who has no experience in that um, you know, community or whatever or, um, or culture would, would not understand and, and maybe they wouldn't be, you know, recommend funding it. So I highly recommend um, going like SAIR, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. They um, are just put a call out for reviewers. Um, and so there's a link to their um, MailChimp uh, campaign that they put out to, for a link to the to the website there, but you can also go to SARE.org um, and, and get on that. And that's a USDA program. And I'll talk a little bit more about SARE because it's been a big part of my life. But um, And then the USDA has several different grant review panels. Um, they uh, The link I put there is actually to the Sustainable National Sustainable Ag Coalition, which is a fantastic organization. <laughs> um, and I really respect what they do. Um, but they have a list of all of the different grant review panels you can be on in the USDA. And I, I see a question here about what kind of qualifications they do vet the reviewers. So you can apply. I've had people, I've had friends that have applied and have not been um, picked, but they applied the next year and got picked. Um, it's basically you need to have some experience in the food system and it'll say what qualifications they want to see in um when they talk about the descriptions of who they're looking for. So I recommend checking those out um, and you get paid. <laughs> you do get paid to be on those review panels and most of them are now virtual, which in some ways is kind of unfortunate because um, when we can be in person in those communities, because there's people from all over the country coming. When I did it for Farmer's Market Promotion Program, um, local food promotion program, there were people all over the country and I met some really amazing people on that review panel and I got to go to Washington. So um, all expenses paid. <laughs> Um, so that was nice, but now most of, most of it's Zoom, most of it's via Zoom. Um, and now sometimes actually it's in Kansas City because ERS or um, AM NIFA, the National Institute for Food and Agriculture, as you all know, moved to Kansas City uh, not so long ago. 
and that was a whole other policy thing that I don't know. Anyways, um, there's lots of rabbit holes that go down here with policy issues, but I'll try not to go down them too much, especially political rabbit holes because they only make me angry. Um, so one of the things I, what we do to be engaged is apply for these grants. Um, I have been able, been very fortunate to receive, um, they're all competitive. So you do have to apply, it takes a lot of time. And then you sometimes get picked and you sometimes don't. And when you don't get picked, it feels really bad. <laughs> uh, when you do get picked, it feels really good. Uh, but they are, many of them are competitive, a 50% success rate, like uh, like if 50% of the applicants get um, funded, that's a pretty high percentage. Some of these grant applications are like at 10% funding. Um, and that actually, you know, the National Sustainable Ag Coalition uses that information to show how popular this program is and how desired it is by farmers. And they can, that can help them, you know, get some more funding into those programs. Because I don't know um, if it was explained, but NSAC has a uh, an office like right around the corner from Capitol Hill. And they send people over to Capitol Hill all the time to have a bug in the ear of those representatives who are on the Ag Committee. And so by joining an organization that's part of the NSAC family, you then put your voice and lend your voice to that national group. Um, but then also by securing these grants and being part of them, it gives you legitimacy. Um, the Farmer Rancher Grant is a great one to go after through SARE. Um, and the also specialty crop block grants through either Missouri Department of Ag or Kansas Department of Ag are pretty accessible for farmers, although they are reimbursement. So you have to spend the money and then submit for reimbursement. Um, it's not all in one chunk. You can do it in, you know, like one month you've had this, these expenses and you submit for that month, but you do have to front that cost. And same with value added producer grants, which are really great through rural development. And I think one thing that will help you in your advocacy is to really understand the structure of the USDA. And we don't have time to go into that right now, but there are seven branches of the USDA and they all operate very, very differently. Um, and so I think learning about them and, and knowing how you can engage with the different branches is pretty important as well. Um, then from a policy standpoint, you know, apply to serve on some of these advisory committees. Um, you know, like I said, get involved with NSEC, um, at the very least get on their newsletter. I have um, always wanted to be part of an organization that was part of NSEC, but I have not been able to be successful in that yet. We're working on it. Hopefully, um, my nonprofit will eventually become a member of NSEC. Um, but like the National uh, Food Systems Leadership Network is another one to get involved with, uh, become listed on there and, and interact with that organization. Um, food Policy Councils, I know we have um, a member of our Food Policy Council here, Tom Ogieri, he's on the call here. Um, and I have served on the Food Policy Council in Kansas City. Um, so definitely get involved with them. Um, and then there are national advisory committees, and I'm not exactly sure how these work, but um, I think uh, I, I just heard a, a podcast from someone who's on the National Urban Agriculture Advisory Committee, and they kind of basically form these committees, um, put a call out, and you apply to become you know, a member of one of these committees. And probably in your young farming career, you might not have the credentials to be chosen, but later you might be able to serve on one of these national advisory committees. And um, you know, they do let the USDA know how to help um, in a better way. Because you know, people at the USDA, some of them really, really care. They really want to see a strong food system. And um, sometimes they don't know how best to engage. And so by being part of the conversation, you can really help guide them. Um, and like with your grant reports, you're helping to legitimize their programs um, by being a participant and doing a good job on your projects. Um, uh, and so the other thing that uh, is on my radar, which I don't always have time for, are these comment periods through the USDA. Um, there's one open right now for the animal welfare portion of the National Organic Program. And so you can go on to the USDA's website um, to comment about that rule that's being enacted and, and, um, and, and make your voice heard. Um, that's ex the, there is a new grant proposal or uh, request for proposals out right now. It's called the Regional Food Systems Business Centers. And um, it's a direct result of comments made in an open public comment period about our food system and how we can make it stronger. 
it came out of those comments. Um, so they did respond. They read every single comment that the public made. I know somebody who was on the committee that read those comments and had to collate them into like one document. Um, and she said, you know, they read, read all 940 of them and that shaped this, uh, this proposal, which is a $400 million pool of money. Um, so these things do matter. I mean, it feels like a drop in the bucket, but, uh, you know, they do, your voice does matter. Um, the other thing you can do as a farmer is engage your customers. Um, I know we don't really want to be super political uh, with our customers, especially we don't want to find out necessarily what their political leanings are, and they probably don't want to find out what our political leanings are. So, um, but there's ways to talk about food systems that is very nonpartisan. Um, and so like for an example, a few years ago, we had a right to farm bill that was being voted on um, here in Missouri. And you know the farmers market tried to do some education and things, and I won't go into everything that happened, but you know that was a piece of legislation that was developed out of um, a very uh, right-leaning think tank that didn't really come from the people, um, and so it was being sort of pushed onto the state. And I think you know we really tried to educate our consumers. And even though we're just a, you know at the time I was at Brookside Farmers Market, we're just a small drop in the bucket of consumers. It had an effect because there's influential people there, um, and while that legislation did pass, um, it was a narrow margin, which was a surprise. Um, but that was the work of advocacy from people like us and our consumers. Um, and I think, you know, that's mostly what I wanted to talk about. You can run for office, like uh, Amanda said, and, um, you know, try to get engaged that way. I think the, uh, an important thing to remember is to pick your battles. Um, there's a lot of ways to engage, but you really have to um, make it so that it works for you and your farm and your family um, and find ways to get paid for your work. <laughs> um, the grant review committees are great because they actually do pay pretty well. I think it's like a $900 stipend for the beginning farmer rancher grants. Um, and if there's travel involved, you know, they pay for all of that. But there are ways to get paid. And if somebody is trying to work with you, like a university for research, they have a grant, they want to do something, or they want your voice, you know, see if there's money to pay for uh, you driving to Jeff City or getting, you know, flown into Washington, D.C. Those are usually covered through some funding. Um, but even, you know, your, your voice to be able to talk to these legislators, see if there's money to help you um, so you can get there and not, um, you know, be undervalued for what you know, because you know a lot being on the farm and, and working. Um, so yeah, thanks for posting the livestock uh, standard rule there, uh, Andrea. And I think that's it on my, on my side. Thanks, Katie. We just heard a lot of really incredible information from people who know a lot from the, from the fields to the to the state legislators, that's just amazing. Um, the, the lineup that we were able to bring in to, to share with you um, today. So I've been monitoring the chat and there have been a couple questions throughout. Uh, and I was trying to remember when they came in and who they're directed to. Um, so I'll, um, I'll read those. And then we have about 10 more minutes um, for Q and A. So if, if you wanna drop something in the chat, um, we'll read those as well and try to Get the right speakers. So if, if all our speakers who are still here um, want to go ahead and make yourselves known and heard again um, as, as we go along. But the first um, question, um, we had a couple of questions, both at the local um, and the state level about climate change and where that fits in um, on the different um, committees, specifically in the state house, but also the local level on the different plans. Um, if anybody has a minute uh, to speak to that um, as far as regenerative agriculture and um, climate change, where, where those conversations are happening. Eileen or Yolanda, do you have any, any thoughts on the state level? Or I see Andrea. So on the federal legislative level, that just went through in the last couple of months. Um, it really was a climate bill, although it was branded as the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, there was um, a lot of push from national advocacy organizations 
um, to include funding for regenerative or sustainable agriculture programs in that um, to make ag more climate smart. Um, and it's definitely on the table um, moving into the farm bill year. Um, others might have more insight um, on that than I do, but it's definitely uh, in conversations at the, the federal level. And I think, Tom, one of your uh, initial questions was also during the local uh, local presentations about whether urban ag is in the climate resilience plan. And the short an answer is yes, it is. The longer answer is what will it look like? Um, and that's that's up to us to, to kind of push on and, and make sure. I would say it was a, the, one of the weaker parts of the, climate, the city of Kansas City, Missouri's climate resilience plan. Um, as far as dedicating time and energy. Well, I have a walnut tree above my head that is just dropping like crazy right now. Um, any any other thoughts on that um, before we jump into, there was a question for Tom um, about defining large agriculture. And this was when you were talking about um, the limiting the subsidies for large agriculture, what that means. So if you could, um, yeah, um, that. so that was actually based on a specific uh, NSAC policy proposal that they've published a couple of white papers on. And I think, um, so they're not looking at a number of acreage or anything. They are actually looking at a set dollar amount of crop insurance subsidies. So this would be putting a cap on crop insurance subsidies, so not the total um you know, sort of farm bill uh, program reimbursements for a farm, but crop insurance subsidies at $50,000 per farm. Um, and if they set that, um, I think it would it would be like less than 1% of the farms would be affected by that, but it would save like $10 billion. I mean, it's like a ridiculous amount of money that it would save for a very, for impacting a very small amount of farms. So basically, um, those are, are huge farms that are getting like massive amounts of subsidies. And so if we just limit that to $50,000 per farm, um, we'd save a lot of money and not impact very many folks. But that could be for, I mean, similar things could be debated for any program, like um, a lot of those uh, programs sort of uh, benefit large scale uh, disproportionately, I would say. I muted because of my walnut storm. Was that the follow up? Is that 50,000 per crop or 50,000 total on the? So that that is just the subsidy and that is per farm. If I am correct here, um, I am going to dump the link into the chat here. Oops. So, yeah. And Amanda asks, is there any hope that specialty crops would be considered commodities and qualify for the same subsidies? So just to answer that a little bit uh, from a risk management, um, what do they call it? RMA, risk management agency. They um, have a whole farm protection, crop insurance, and you know the whole commodity thing is really about crop insurance. <laughs> Um, and so they're looking at covering specialty crops in a way that uh, covers them like a commodity farm might be covered, but not a totally different setup. So like, let's say you grow, you know, 20 different things, you would actually apply as your whole farm revenue rather than a specific crop being covered. Because the problem with like even like apples and strawberries and watermelons and potatoes and tomatoes can actually be covered as like a commodity crop through insurance for some of the of these ag insurance um, policies. But the problem is for us, like we grow four, 40 to 60 different things and we're not, and you know, tomatoes are one part, an important part of our revenue stream, but they're not the only one. And so this other sort of idea of crop insurance to cover the whole farm and make sure that it's diverse because you have to be growing three or more things to be covered under the whole farm uh, revenue. And I believe 
Scott Fellman um, participates in that program. He's the only farmer that I know of that does it. It's not an easy program to be part of, and they're still working out a lot of the kinks. But um, that is one way that our specialty crops can be covered more like a commodity insurance program where, you know, if we have a total loss on something, we can try to make it up through that insurance. So I will just say um, that there is a the whole farm revenue and there's a new micro insurance program that the USDA is trying to respond to some of the criticisms of the whole farm program. Um, so they're trying to make yeah. it better. Um, and uh, Andrew and I both posted links to information sessions that are coming up about those programs. So. Great. Yeah, and I wanted to say one more thing about that, and that's, um, you know, part of the reason they keep trying to redo it is because they come out with these policies and they haven't necessarily consulted with the farmers, you know, <laughs> like, how is this going to work on farm? And so they're responding to some of the headaches involved. But then the other thing I'll say is they actually, because it's, the way capitalism works in our country, we're often outsourcing a lot of the policy to private companies. So for example, you know, the USDA program is enforced by private companies. Um, it is, there's 99 certifiers in the United States. It's not, it's not, people are not certified by the USDA. They are certified by a, a USDA certifier that's approved through the USDA. And that's the same thing for crop insurance. Farmers are getting crop insurance from private companies that are then working with the USDA to implement those policies. And so to find a crop insurance person who will like implement a whole farm revenue policy for your farm is really hard because those private insurers don't want to necessarily write that policy. It's complicated and they don't get a lot of money from it. So that's one thing to sort of think about too is like, okay, how are these policies being implemented on the ground um, and so, I, yeah, it's good to know that. Thanks, Katie. That's a really helpful, like, layer that, that you don't see until you're trying to get that insurance and you can't find anyone to write the policy. Um, all right. Well, I'm not seeing any more um, questions in the chat. If I missed one between all the links, let me know. Um, but I just wanted to wrap up really quickly. Um, we have heard some, a lot of different resources, a lot of information, um, and just, I think I'd encourage you all to think about as a starting point, just what is that, if you tried to go out and do everything at every level of policy that we've heard about today, it would be more than a full-time job for you to try to, to engage in a meaningful way. So, so really think about where, it makes sense for you to get to get engaged where your farm's story um, or your whatever, whatever, however you interact with the food system, um, where your story fits in and where your passion fits in, um, because that's what's going to drive um, your ability to engage um, in a really meaningful way. So if you feel like it and want to drop in the chat what you're excited about, if it's local zoning, if it's federal farm bill. Um, Please do state state committees, all all the things. Yeah, good point, Tom. Or what you're angry about. That's another way to motivate motivate yourself to to make the time for this. I think we're at a time um, that we we're really seeing some some things happening that support the kinds of food systems and and agriculture that we're we're engaged with. Whether it's the Office of Urban Agriculture at the USDA. Um, that was created through the last farm bill. Um, that's you know directly impacting some of the work that at least cultivates doing and other organizations in the area, and has the the opportunity really to expand. And we're seeing local climate resilience plans getting updated. We're seeing urban farm tax credits happening on the state level. Um, so I think you know there is a lot of movement happening, and it's it's an exciting time to to find a way to get involved. Um, we will be sending out a follow-up um, email, Lacey and I, um, compiling all the great resources we heard about from all our speakers. So that's an easy to grab place for all of you, as well as a recording to this presentation. We're also putting together a, a Google survey to kind of poll you on, on what you're excited about or angry about, um, or where you might want to plug in as something to, sh um, to start kind of building a, a roster for for the Kansas City area, I think you know we're in a really unique spot as we've heard from 
from both the Kansas and the Missouri side when people were putting their state reps and senators in. I think two people shared a, sen a state senator, but otherwise it was a dozen different different people. So we, in just on this Zoom with 20 to 30 people, were able to reach a lot of people that are sitting sitting in these positions of power. So I think that um, is a really exciting thing for us as a region to keep in mind and, and to make sure that we're talking to each other um, about what efforts um, need to happen. And then also, you know, really getting to know and build strong relationships with all those different people. Um, and I think, you know, we've we've heard all these different different coalitions and organizations you can connect to. And that that is really an important part of the next steps um, is just really getting plugged in and, and figuring out the right place for you. Lacey, is there anything else you want to add to, to wrap up? No, I think you covered it. I just want to give a huge thank you to all our speakers. Like, this is really an incredible panel to bring together in one place. And um, as Ami said, we know it's a lot of information, but just take bite-sized pieces um, and hope that there was something here that ignited you either um, with anger or with excitement. Thank you. And thanks to Growing Growers. I don't think we really gave a shout out to Growing Growers, the, the program that brought us all together um, for this event today. So shout out to Growing Growers and the great work that they do. All right, we'll leave it at that. Thank you.